nice to have you all here. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for caring about what happens to this nation. Unfortunately, too many people don't care or don't have a clue. That's why those of us that know what's going on, we got to outwork and outvote the clueless <laughs> in order to take our government back. I've seen him before. He's either a lawyer supporter or a stalker. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you all. And I want to thank Bob and his organization for setting this up because it does give me an opportunity to uh, get a chance to meet and see a lot of the people all in one day. Now, this isn't my first time here. Those of you that have seen me in here, now, this is my 19th visit. And it won't be my last visit. Because I now understand why and how power is so critical to this whole process. You ask informed questions, and I'm not just saying that because I'm an hour. This is where the vetting process really starts. And it's good. It's been great. I believe, and then we do question the question with Dr. Bob today, we'll take questions. One of the reasons that I'm running for the presidency of the United States is that I believe that we have become a nation of crises. Not one, but multiple crises. After 2006, after I finished my cancer treatment, I'm now five years of survival, stage four cancer, totally cancer free, five years. After that, I went back to a radio station, WSB in Atlanta, and they gave me my Saturday radio show back. I said, that's nice. And then, I was on my Saturday radio show for about nine months. And then, they came to me and said that the ratings were doing so good, we want you to do a five nights a week, three hours a night, full-time talk radio show from seven to ten. I said, that's a job. <laughs> when did somebody tell you all I was looking for a job? You know, doing a radio show once a week is a nice little hobby. But doing it five nights a week is a job. And to make a long story short, they made me an offer that I could not refuse. And I ended up accepting the, that job, that responsibility. Here's what it did. I had to study the issues in order to be able to talk about the issues and answer the questions. In other words, I couldn't remain fat, dumb, and happy about what's going on in America. It forced me to know too much about how bad things are. And as a result, I got frustrated when President Obama took office, brought in his cronies, his intellectuals, and they started to dismantle this great nation and this economy. I couldn't sit back and just not do what I could do. Not everybody can run the president. Not everybody, but everybody can do something. And if everybody does something, guess what? We win. If everybody does what they can do, we win. I'm driving a camera people crazy right now. I just keep moving and normally they can just Put a stationary, sit down, and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Herbie Cain is here today. Y'all gonna have to work. <laughs> Stay on your toes. I couldn't just sit still and not do anything. Matthew 25, 24. One of the lessons I learned growing up in the church. If you have a talent, you're supposed to use it. Not bury it. Not keep it on a golf cart three times a week what my plan was. But things change when you realize what God's plan is. I had been blessed to live my American dream. To succeed in corporate America. Multiple times. That was my plan. But then that was God's plan. And God doesn't reveal His plan to you all at once. 
Because we couldn't handle it. And I've done a lot of prayers since 1999 to figure out what it is I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life. <coughs> and ultimately, this journey led me to make the decision to run for president. 1999, my daughter, my granddaughter, my first granddaughter was born. First time I looked in her face, I knew that something was up then. The first time I looked in her face when she was born, I was able to get to the hospital that night. Able to look in her face, and the first thought that went to my mind was, what do I do to make this a better world and a better nation? I didn't know the answer then. Then after that, and after running for the United States Senate, came in an impressive second, I kind of thought that, well, I tried politics, I'm not supposed to win, so I'm going to go back and try to play golf like I wanted to. And then I got into radio and the other things happened. And then when the Obama administration took over and the straw that broke the camel's back, along with a lot of prayer, was the day President Obama signed Obamacare against the will of the American people. Oh. And to add insult to injury, he signed it on my son's birthday. <laughs> that really ticked me off. And so the journey starts. We've got, we are a nation of crises. Let me just give you seven of them. We have a moral crisis. We have an economic crisis. We got an entitlement spending crisis. Not just a spending crisis, an entitlement spending crisis. We got an energy crisis. We got an immigration crisis. We got a foggy foreign policy crisis. Foggy foreign policy. And they like to try to dig me because they say, well, you don't have any foreign policy experience. And Obama does. <laughs> I have run stuff, fixed stuff, turned around stuff, started stuff as in business stuff. At least I've done that. And created some jobs and saved some companies and saved some industries. And our biggest crisis is we have a deficiency of leadership crisis. Engage the people. 
don't try to pass a 2700 page bill and even they didn't read it you and I didn't have time to read it we're too busy trying to live send our kids to school and that's why I'm going to only allow small bills three pages <laughs> that one over the dinner table. Now, what is Herman K. President Kane talking about in this particular bill? And Senator Eric Dirksen said it best. When they feel the heat, they will see the light. Y'all got to be my heat when I get there, okay? You got to be my heat. That's how we're going to get stuff done. That's how we're going to get stuff done. Well, let's try this little problem-solving approach to some of these crises that are talked about. Let's, let's, let's start with one that they don't like to talk about. Social Security. We've got a problem. We can't sustain it. What do we do about it? Well, the only thing that they've done for the past couple of decades is raise the retirement age, raise the taxes, lower the benefits. They're talking about doing this again. Raise the right retirement age. When I started out as a young man, working my first job out of college, you know, I could retire full benefits on Social Security at age 65. And I could retire early at age 62. Because I started working my first real job when I was 22 years old. Okay, I am now 65. The early retirement age now for me is either 66 or 68. It's like chasing a rabbit. I ain't gonna never catch this rabbit. <laughs> they keep moving it. That's not a solution. Let's do what the country of Chile did. They had a social security system very similar to ours 30 years ago. They had down payroll, you know, our payroll tax is 15.3%, right? When you get your pay stub, you look on the FICA. Those who get pay stubs, look under FICA, 15.3%. 12.4% of that is just for the Social Security piece. I remember when my son started working and had his first job working for me at Godfather's when I was still running Godfather's Pizza. He got his first paycheck. He was so excited about it. He called me up, Dad, I got my first paycheck. Good. Dad, I got a question. What's that? That's, who is this guy, Fico, <laughs> that I'm sharing my money with? <laughs> it's called Uncle Sam, Vincent. Who is Fico? Chile said, okay, we got to solve the problem. So they developed a personal retirement accounts option. Now, with all due respect to all of the media in the room, I did not say privatization. It is not privatization. The words personal and privatization are not interchangeable. This is how it was demagogued when Bush tried it back in 2003. And his fellow Republicans did not help educate the public on this. They used scare tactics like they're using scare tactics with Medi-Scare to scare folk. I said personal retirement option. For people below a certain age, you have that option. And it will be an account with your name on it. Your name. Not the system that we have now. You don't have any idea how much you're going to get. Or if anything's going to be there. If we continue along the current route, it will be bankrupt. Broke. You don't like to say that. We'll be broke. It'll be broke. It'll consume so much of our revenue that the system will collapse and our whole economy will collapse. That's how you fix the problem. Work on the right problem. So in other words, I sum it up by saying we must restructure these programs, not reshuffle these programs. A lot of restructuring to do. We've got to restructure Medicare. That's what Representative Bryan is trying to do. He's out there fighting a good fight. I not only agree with the budget and the proposal, that Representative Ryan is trying to explain to the folk 
but I also think the world of him for having the courage to get out there and try and explain it. And that's what we've got to do if we're going to get some of these problems solved. Medicaid. We can't just keep throwing money at it. We've got to restructure the program, starting with making a block grant. Every state is a little different. Every state is different. Don't have unfunded mandates in it. For example, when the Democrats controlled Congress before the Republicans retook control of the House, they, in Obamacare, they increased the poverty level for which you could qualify for Medicaid. Instead of being three times poverty, let's say it was four times. Made, they made it easier for people to get on Medicaid rather than making it more difficult. So what's the incentive to help yourself if you're going to make it easy for people to depend upon the government program? I am as compassionate as the next person. But my compassion has with it a requirement to help people who are willing to help themselves. And so Medicaid is one of those that we can do something about it, but we're going to have to restructure the program. Energy. We can become energy independent. We have enough resources to become energy independent. We don't have an electricity addiction in this country. We have an oil addiction. We, we generate all of the resources for our electricity right here in the United States of America. And we spend $38 billion a year. $30 billion a year. That's one of the best deals we get. We spend $600 billion on oil. And nearly 70% of it is foreign oil. Where do you think that money is going? You know where it's going. It's going to countries where people don't like us. But they love our money. This is why we have to have a real energy independence strategy. And I have one. And we're going to have it developed by the time I take office. So, regardless of which of these crises, immigration, real quick. Immigration is four problems. We've got to work on all four. Remember, started out with working on the right problem? <clears throat> First problem, secure the border. <laughs> secure the border. I had a call to my radio show one night probably. Mr. King, you conservatives ought to stop talking about securing that border. Y'all know y'all can't build a fence to secure the whole southern part of this country. I said, oh, yeah. Uh, I just got back from China. Ever heard of the Great Wall of China? Uh, it looks pretty sturdy. And that sucker's real high. I think we can build one if we want to. We have put a man on the moon. We can build a fence. Now, my fence might be part brick wall and part electrical, you know, technology, you know. I'm describing my events. Somebody one night got a call and said, that's insensitive. I said, what's insensitive? I said, put me in charge of the fence. And it'll be a 20-foot wall, barbed wire, electric fire at the top, and on this side of the fence, I'd have that moat that President Obama talked about. <laughs> and I would put those alligators in that moat. <laughs> then the caller says, that's being insensitive and incompassionate. Tell that to the family of the rancher that got killed. When they came, they walked across the border and told him to leave his land in three days or they were going to kill him. He dismissed all of his workers, went inside his home and waited three days with his guns and took six of them with him before they killed him. Who is insensitive? But we got a lot of technology we can use to secure the 
Secondly, enforce the laws that are already there. We don't need new laws. We enforce the laws that are already there. We've got to clean up the e verify system. We've got to make it easy for people to hire legal folk here. We've got to make it easier. Third, promote the path to citizenship that's already there. We just need to clean up the bureaucracy. We just need to clean up the cumbersomeness of it. And then fourth, how do we deal with the illegals that are already here? Empower the states to do what the federal government will not and not do. I know this might sound like common sense, but what you do is you take the immigration laws and the line that says the United States can deport, the United States can do this, just add a phrase, the United States or a state. Just put a couple of new words in there. Empower the states. The states know better how they want to deal with that particular issue. Remember one of my guiding principles? Want to know how to solve the problem? Go to the source closest to the problem. And in this case, it's the states, not the federal government. So that's my approach no matter what problem we're talking about. My economic plan is two phases. Phase one is to provide an economic boost within the first 60 to 90 days, ask Congress to give me a bill that will reduce the top corporate and personal tax rates at a maximum of 25%, take the capital gains tax rate to zero. I didn't say cut it in half, I said take it to zero. If you really want to stimulate some gain on somebody's capital, take it to zero. That's what you do with the banks, get money to loan to you and to provide lines of credit. They don't get it from the big, company, the big banks. Suspend taxes on repatriated profits and keep up coming. <laughs> Don't you think? No. <laughs> I can slow down. I'm from the South. <laughs> I can talk slow if I have to. <laughs> I'm just having fun, okay? Suspend taxes on repatriated profits. We got nearly a trillion dollars offshore. And it won't come home because it's going to be double taxed. And then this along with some other ideas <coughs> made them permanent. Remove uncertainty from this economy. Uncertainty is killing economic growth in this country. We don't even know what's happening. mentioning these ideas in Washington, D.C., which is dangerous. And there was a group of reporters, which is dangerous. Now, I'm not picking on the reporters. Don't, don't, don't get mad at me or write bad stuff. It's just that some of your colleagues in D.C., they don't have their heads screwed on right. So they said, that all sounds good. You can't do that in Washington, D.C. I said, why? Because it's hard. Let me get this straight. Do you not do something that's right, even though it is difficult? I said, then you don't know very much about me. And remember my fifth P, the people, uh, you will bring the heat when that legislation is being teed up. Okay? You'll bring the heat. We'll get it through. That's phase one. We need an immediate boost. Phase two, totally replace the tax code with the fair tax, which is the national tax. Art Lapper, Art Lapper, the economist you see on Fox a lot, got it brilliant. He has calculated from a study that he did, he and some of his colleagues did, that for every dollar you pay into the government for taxes, for every dollar, it costs you and me 30 cents just to file and comply. 30 cents. Do you think maybe the average American family could use that 30 cents? You see, all of these crises, folks, that's the attack on the family. In addition to the cultural attacks, gasoline is now hovering around $4 a gallon, which is a tipping point, which means that every time it goes above $4 a gallon, people are 
or take his money out of one of their other pockets, buy gas to go to work, or to take the kids back to go to school. It's reached a tipping point. This is why we need to do the energy independence strategy to reduce and eliminate our dependence on foreign oil. It is possible to totally eliminate our dependence on foreign oil, folks. In addition to maximizing all of the resources that we have, we also have to encourage flex fuel technology in automobiles, cars, and buses, and things like that. And the thing about it is we already have the technology. They use it in Brazil. Do you know where they got the technology, who developed the technology for the automobiles in Brazil that use flex fuel technology? Us. Our U.S. oil companies developed it. When I was in Brazil, I said, tell me about this flex fuel technology. They told me about it. I said, well, who makes these cars? They said, General Motors, Ford, <laughs> Chrysler. They know how to do this stuff. Why don't we do it here? And we can. But with that, Bob, I'm going to pause and take some questions and all that good stuff. But I kind of want to give you all a brief overview of how I go about solving problems. I don't have all the answers.